that I mean at the top of the top of the top before even the show intro. I'm impressed. We are excited to announce that we're doing our live fantasy things draft show on Sunday, August the 18th at the Miracle Theater in Washington DC, our nation's capital. For those of you interested, the full details including the time and the price will be available when tickets go on sale this coming Monday, July the 1st. We're going to be sending out the link via our newsletter, which you can sign up for at solidverbal.com. If you're a subscriber of the newsletter, you're going to get a head start on the tickets. Eventually, we'll be posting the link out to a wider audience later in the day. So if you're interested, sign up for that newsletter now. Oh my gosh. I mean, I think it's a no-brainer to me. Can I jump in real quick? Because I think there's a bit of an asterisk as well. Sure. We are also efforting and as of right now, as of the time this show is coming out, we have not yet confirmed, but are on the path to confirming a second Fantasy Things draft live show in Big 12 country. Is that correct? A state where college football and barbecue may be very popular. Oh, my is- gosh. Shout out Ames, Iowa. Oh, so I wasn't supposed to. Okay. We're not confirmed. Not yet. No. Not yet. Okay. Um, so we are, we are efforting. We are trying to lock in a venue and lock in a town and situation we are i think we're really close so quite excited for the potential of a dual fantasy things draft live show experience in august doesn't the nfl draft move around now every year i don't know if they do two in one year but what the hell if nothing else we are following suit of how college football things get drafted and i'm i'm so excited we already have a list mounting tie and i have some grand designs about how these shows are going to go that you're going to want to be there again efforting big 12 country DC show is going to be wild. Sunday, August the 18th, the Miracle Theater in Washington, D.C. If you're in the area, subscribe to the newsletter. We'll send out that link on Monday. You can go to solidrebel.com. There's a big old form there where you can fill out your email address. We won't spam you. We're just going to send you the important tidbits. Just give us your email. We'll send it out to you as soon as details are available. And of course, if you live in another state where maybe college football and barbecue is popular, Keep your radar up in August. Yeah. Don't just listen to the show, but also subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on social media for more information as it becomes available. We're excited. Fantasy Things 2019 is finally upon us. When I think summer destinations, I think DC in August, (laughs) and I think this possible state where barbecue is quite popular in August. So uh, I'll bring the gold bond tie. (laughs) Welcome to the Solid Verbal. The Solid Verbal. Come after me! I'm a man! I'm 40! I've heard so many players say, well, I want to be happy. You want to be happy for a day? Eat a steak. It's that woo woo! And now, Dan and Ty. Welcome back to the Solid Verbal, boys and girls. My name is Ty Hildenbrand. Joining me, as always, my man over there in the big city, Daniel Rubenstein. Sir, how are you? I am fortified with pork. With pork? Um, you said pork, right? Yeah, I had a I had a giant Cuban sandwich for lunch. Okay. And I was just very excited for this show and all of the opinions and the fire takes. Yep. Not really. I was going to throw out into the college football podcast universe. So I really wanted to make sure my, my blood sugar wasn't low. So I'm doing well. So I got to be honest with you, Dan. The last two days at the Mysterious Day Job have really been kicking my behind. <laughs> yeah. Worked two consecutive 12-hour days, was up early at like 4 a.m. Yeah. And I got to be honest here, while I'm tired, when you lose your sense of time and place, when you don't really have that sense of the fourth dimension, Mm -hmm. it really eases a lot of stress. I'm riding high right now. I got Yeah, I got the second wave going. Love it. Not really sure what time it is, but I'm ready to do our book report on the (laughs) 2011 so-called Game of the century, Dan. Yeah, we are not the first podcast to re-watch something and do a show about it. We are not the first sports podcast, probably not the first college football podcast, but I'm not positive about that, to re-watch something and form new opinions after the fact. But here we are doing it, Ty. We're doing it. Um, this was a game that I, I actually, I vividly remember not just the game itself, 
but our reaction, my reaction, and the pushback that we and people who were thinking like we were after the game, where I was like, this was not a fun football game, and getting a lot of, you don't appreciate good defense. Right, the Gary Danielson approach. Right. Well, it was it was went far further than Gary, but um and I wanted to rewatch this one specifically to make sure I wasn't misremembering my thoughts after watching it now going on what 8 years ago? <sighs> yeah. 8 years wow. so that's two full cycles, two full generations of players roughly who have come in and out of college football. So the time feels right to attack this with fresh eyes, right? I, I agree. And not only are we attacking it, but as you yeah. said, other shows, there's a whole show called yeah. The Rewatchables about not yeah. college football or sports, but this is not a new concept by any stretch. No. Of course, though, in true solid verbal fashion, we did need to put our own spin on it. So rather than just going through quarter by quarter, MVP thought by of thought, the first quarter, we're not going to do that. No. Instead, we actually went out to the Mensa website. <laughs> Mensa for kids. Mensa for kids. I'm sorry. Yeah. Of course. Mensa for kids. To see what their recommendations were around children writing book reports. Mm -hmm. And we've got things in front of us here. Setting, plot, main characters, themes, opinion, mm -hmm. and analysis. Uh-huh. How does it compare to similar games? Does it engage your emotions, make you laugh, cry, have you on the edge of your seat? Who was your favorite character? Were there predictable twists and turns in the story? We're going to take the whole Mensa children's book report approach to the mm -hmm. 2011 LSU Alabama game. We're treating this game like it's Charlotte's Web. Is that, that is, what? That is right. Yes. What, what's the end? What does the, the spider spell out? Is it some pig? Maybe by the end of the, this episode... We will award who our some pig is. <laughs> All right. So that? before we move on, we have had numerous subscriptions over the last, I don't know, two weeks to our newsletter of intent. Keep them coming. I, I must report, though, just a quick update. Yeah. I still can't figure out how to turn off the damn notifications. Really? This is not at all fabric. I cannot figure out how to turn these things off. My phone insists on buzzing every time I get a new subscription. So I'm telling you, I'm in a meeting. I'm doing things at the mysterious day job. Sometimes you want to shout anybody out who subscribed recently? No, I don't. I don't want to breach that privacy, Dan. Steve, Kendra. But every time we get a new subscription to the newsletter of intent, just go to <laughs> solidverbal.com. My phone buzzes wherever I am. We are going to be sending that out in very short order. We've got new shirts that are in the Solid Verbal store. We do. We do. Three new shirts, uh, one of which is a fun modified pizza recipe, pizza shop recipe type look. The another one is kind of a just a logo badge. And the third one is a, a drum and fife shirt. Yes. <laughs> a big stanky Pat Lee rundown I love honoring it. shirt. So three, well, I guess there's more than that because there's different color options for those, but a bunch of different options, a couple tanks. If you're looking for a new tank for the summer, a tank top. And... Very excited by those. Solidverbal.com slash store will get you to the right place should you be interested in taking a look and perhaps buying a new Solid Verbal 2019 shirt. Also, we're looking into mugs and maybe tumblers because people are thirsty and maybe they already have five Solid Verbal shirts and they are extremely loyal verballers and are also extremely thirsty verballers. So we'll help you out there. Also, we're looking into getting some old shirts activated. Correct. Which has been a popular request over the years. And finally, we have slightly modified our ordering process, by which I mean there's not a pre-order anymore. If you place right. an order, your order should ship within about one to two weeks, which means you should get it sooner. If you order now, you'll definitely have them in time for the start of the 2019 season, which is very exciting. By the way, the, the some pig thing, Wilbur. Wilbur, the name. yeah. I just, Wilbur. just came to me. Wilbur is the name. So we're going to award... We're not really doing awards, but we will award the Wilbur of the game. The Wil Wilbur of the game. Will well, that's yeah. Um, different Wilbur. I'm, I'm quite ex different Wilbur, but all the same. If you think about it, we are filled with moho pork and excitement. So, were you good at book reports? 
Was that were you a, a, a voracious reader as a kid? I was definitely not a voracious reader, but I'm oh, I'm man. I'm now and have always been a pretty good writer. So I could cover up a lot of sins mm. by writing a well worded, well written, grammatically accurate book report. So you were not doing all of the reading over summer break necessarily. I no. I was able to <laughs> it's, a, it's a safe place. I was able to devour one of those cliff notes things. Okay. As I got older, up into high school, and then write a book report based on that. Not that we were doing a whole lot of them once right. you got to high school, but throughout elementary school. I loved reading. Hey, I did my fair share of book reports on the Matt Christopher books. Yeah. The Fox Steals Home, The Year Mom Won the Pennant. We're talking classic American novels here. Yeah, I remember everybody in my class is reading very, like, they're doing like a Goosebumps. Goosebumps, like, a little R.L. Stein. Stuff. And I was doing like Lou Gehrig, a biography. Right. That's <laughs> right. I was that's going that out. direction. Um, but yeah, I was I was pretty good at book reports. I liked reading a whole bunch. But yeah, a lot of sports stuff, uh, a lot of Hardy Boys. And so we're going to treat LSU Bama 2011. We're going to attack it as if it were a, I don't know, dense, a little bit tedious. <laughs> it may have, may have been the David Foster Wallace of games. I don't know. But here we are. And... Should we start? Is there any? Do you want to play like the CBS? But we don't, probably don't have that licensed. So. I, we don't have any of these licensed. Bah, 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 bah. I found this from 1992. See if it rings okay. any bells. Children who love to read can grow to new heights, expand their knowledge by discovering new worlds, stretch their imagination by reaching for the stars. Book It is a reading incentive program that encourages young people to read. Support your children's participation in their school's Book It program. Or to find out how to enroll their school, write to this address. And then they put an address. So that was the old yep. Book It program. You remember that? I do remember. I remember that. I remember reading is fundamental. Yeah, yeah. And Asner was in an ad I found. And then, Ty, I think you have this. You got to watch Reading Rainbow, right? I have it. <laughs> Shout out LeVar Burton. That's right. We've got it all here. Exciting. We're doing our old school book report episode. Where do we want to start out with this? What is what is okay. the best way to... I guess we have to lay the setting down if we're going to do a proper book report. This is correct. November 5th, 2011. Um, many, many weeks into the season. I think it was week, what, 10, 11? I probably should have had that. But somewhere around well, there. Both, both teams were 8-0 and o going into yes. this game. And an interesting factoid here was mm-hmm. that it was the first time... In history, that two SEC teams entered a regular season game, both undefeated and as number one and number two in the country. Oh, yeah. We had 2006, I remember, Michigan-Ohio State. That was that felt like the previous game hold of that, the century. Hold that thought for a few minutes, okay? Yes, I will. Hold that thought. Um, so it's the first time SEC number one and two go into a game undefeated. That is correct. Other... Okay happenings in the 2011 mm-hmm. season just to bring it all back the yeah. solid verbal by the way was on grantland.com hell yeah that was the one and only year that we were on grantland it was a big year for us as a podcast mm-hmm. we won't spoil the surprise if you don't already remember. are we still on grantland no we were no we're not oh. on Grantland at this point okay. no one's on okay. grantland at this point <laughs> oh damn I won't spoil the surprise on who won the national championship which we'll talk about but mm-hmm. other important news tidbits RG3 won the Heisman that year for Baylor, had an incredible yeah. season. We had a lot of conference realignment going on. Before the 2011 season, we had Boise moving to the Mountain West, BYU moving out of the Mountain West and switching to independent. Mm-hmm. Both Colorado and Nebraska moving. Colorado, of course, from the Big 12 to the Pac-12, Nebraska to the Big 10. And then we had Utah moving over to the Pac-12. Yep. We also, throughout the season, had some other conference realignment announcements. Pitt and Syracuse going to the ACC, A&M and Missouri going to the SEC, and then as part of this big grab to try and figure out what the Big 12 was going to do, we had both TCU and West Virginia agreeing that at some point in the future they were going to move over to become part of the Big 12, the the new 10-team Big 12. And everyone in the Big East lived happily ever up. Nope. Nope. Ooh. Spoiler. Did not um, work. 
<laughs> did not go well for them. So yeah, you were right. Both undefeated going into this game. LSU, if you remember, opened the season beating Oregon at Jerry World. And then just up till this point, Mississippi State, West Virginia, Florida, Auburn, all ranked, all wins for LSU. It's, you know, Jordan Jefferson suspended the first four games of the year for the the fight he got in in the offseason. So Jarrett Lee's the starter. Alabama goes to Penn State. I think it's A.J. McCarron winning out the uh, the starting quarterback job for the Tide because of that game. Arkansas, Florida, Alabama beats both of them. And going into this game, they are allowing, and this is just, I just stupid, 6.8 points per game. This wow. is the best Alabama defense of the Saban era. And it's not particularly close. No. And to put it into, because I know everybody's starved for it, Danalytics terms, they allowed 0.51 points per drive wow. the entirety of the season. There is that so, stat again. There is that sound, po- points per drive. So your pace adjusted. In 2015 and 2016, Alabama led the nation in this stat once again at 1 and 1.02 points per drive. So half of the points allowed per drive Damn. then other nationally leading Alabama defenses. So um, the other context is, which is obviously much bigger than football, this 2011, the spring of 2011, was also the tornado that hit Tuscaloosa, Tuscaloosa and surrounding right. areas. Yeah. And, you know, really tragically took the life of Carson Tinker, the starting long snapper's girlfriend. So there was a lot of emotion just going on in general in the state uh, in, in 2011. So everything and, went into, yeah, and, into the minds of Alabama fans. And, you know, not just, not just within the context of this game, but mm-hmm. a lot of emotion going on around college football. We had the whole yeah. Ohio state thing with Jim Tressel being suspended Correct. for the start of the year. This was the same time when the Nevin Shapiro stuff broke on Yahoo sports down yep. at Miami. Miami. We had uh, Joe Paterno getting fired and so a week after deal, this game. The week after this game. Yeah, I was up at that game when they that played That all Nebraska. broke in the spring, though, right? The the Sarah Ganim. I forgot how you pronounce her last yep, name. Yep, Sarah Ganim. Sure, it broke Sarganim, early, that, but, yeah. but it uh, it obviously materialized and came to a head. And then North Carolina fired Butch Davis amid some of the scandal at North Carolina. A very tumultuous time in college football. And, and that's all not to mention... Nick Foles in a losing effort, which we had a lot of fun with. And I'm not going to play the sound here because I don't want to steal the thunder of the book report. But yeah, just to give you some context about what was going on around college football, they called this one the game of the century. Mm -hmm. And I did not. I should have known this. I should have remembered this, but maybe I just have really bad short term memory. I was thinking as I was going into this game of the century, game of the century, game of the century. This was like a thing. Mm-hmm. Did you know that there have been 14 games of the century since 1900? <laughs> that you went back and looked up. There's actually an games. entire Wikipedia article on game of the century in college football. So I will point out for grammar's sake that 1900 through 1999 was a different century. That is correct. It was the 20th century. Yeah. And... Since the 21st century, so since the year 2000, this is going to be my trivia for you. Okay. There have been four games of the century, so to speak. You (sighs) already got one. Number two. You already got one with Ohio State, Michigan. That was that incredible game where Ohio State won 42 39. And then 30 minutes after the game, the Ohio lottery literally came up 4 2 3 9, which I still, I don't know why I remember that, but I remember that. Okay. There's obviously this game. Yep. And then there were two others since 2000 that were also labeled as a game of the century. Do you know what they were? Can you remember one or both? During the regular season. Not to, just during, let's say, the season, which is a, oh, a little bit okay. of a Oh, okay. So USC, Texas. USC, Texas. The 20... 2000, it was played in 2006. 2006 Rose Bowl, yeah. yes. 2006 Rose Bowl. So the fourth and final game... Uh, was it when Mississippi State was number one? No, it was okay. the 2009 SEC championship between Bama and Florida. Bama, Bama won that one handily. Yeah, Tebow on the sideline emotional. 32-19, or 32-13, yeah. excuse me. Yep. Okay. Emphatic. So, so there's your setting for this game, Dan. I have a big picture of what's happening in the world. What else really is going don't. on in the world? <laughs> um, for whatever reason, 2011... Both in college, college football, it was probably the most impactful and crazy in terms of things 
happening all over the country dramatically that we've seen in a long time. 2007 was unexpected. 2007, 2011 was just dramatic. Um, 2011 was also a big year. I mean, you've got Rihanna, We Found Love, number one song while this game is happening. Wow. Calvin Harris, Rihanna. You got the end of Friday Night Lights, the end of Oprah. We have James Franco and Anne Hathaway hosting the Oscars. <laughs> number one movie of this week, Puss in Boots. Really? Puss in Boots. I never saw that movie. Didn't see that myself. Um, in the spring, Bin Laden is killed. Okay. SEAL Team 6. And then Angry Birds was a thing. Whoa. Angry Birds was very much a thing in 2011. So, a lot happening. A lot happening. In general, let's talk about the plot of this game. So, there was a lot of build up to it. If you watched the broadcast, if you went back and watched the YouTube video, as mm -hmm. you and I both so painfully did, there was a great <laughs> opening stanza there where Tracy Wolfson is is on the sidelines. She's amped up. Everybody's freaking amped up because it's the game of the century, right? Of course. And she goes to Nick Saban. She she asks him, co and she says, Coach, a little funny, which I never quite understood, but Coach, how do you avoid the hype <laughs> in a game like this? Yeah. And Saban just looks at her and says, I, you know, see ball, hit ball. <laughs> yeah, he did say that. That's true. He, he Manny ramirez it. In true Saban fashion, just played the whole thing down and threw cold water on it. Uh, Les Miles did his typical talk with no conjunctions in his pregame interview with Tracy Wolfson. It was apparent that there was a lot going on, 101,000 in attendance. Bobby Kraft was on the sidelines, Dan. We don't, Bobby. <laughs> we, we don't want to know why he was in town. Bob Kraft, yeah. But Bob Kraft on the Alabama sidelines. What was the overarching plot of this game as he saw it? Um, well, first of all, I like that you pointed out that there was just like a parade of a register not going above or below anything. How do you avoid this if it's if a week just got to see ball? ball? How do you be? Um, this game was incredible and not necessarily in a good way. But the, the main plot of this game is how do offenses that are fine usually overcome defenses that are both pretty incredible? And how is it going to turn out when neither offense can really consistently do anything. And so basically the the plot of this game is moving ball a little bit, punting, moving ball a little bit. It, it's either punting or missing field goals or it's a it's a chess match between robots who were not fully programmed <laughs> <laughs> is what this this game ultimately was. Um and the plot to me, I mean I was on the edge of my seat not because I was being engaged from a, an offensive football sense, but you were just waiting for something. That, that to me, I mean, that's more thematic, but the plot is just who is going to survive this attrition of partial incompetence. It was, I'll, I'll give it this, it was suspenseful Yeah, in that it was such a defensive slugfest that you were waiting for something to break. Mm -hmm. You were waiting for something to break because the deeper you got into the game, the more it became apparent that if there was one big play, it was going to totally tilt the outcome in one team's favor. It never really happened. We never had that happen. Both defenses answered the call in their own ways to try and keep that one as close as it did and obviously take the game into OT. Was it predictable? When you were, when you went back and watched, did you remember the rhythms of it? I Yes, I did. I didn't. I did. I, I don't think I gave, at the time, Alabama enough credit for moving the ball like they did. They stalled out and they missed kicks and they made poor decisions in the red zone and that was a theme of theirs throughout the season and really throughout a lot of the Jim McElwain era of being good enough on offense to overwhelm teams eventually because of their defense wearing teams down. But they were, when they actually had to make strategic play making decisions, it really stalled out pretty consistently against good teams. And so that to me was not, I, I did not remember how all purpose Trent Richardson was in this game. He returned to kick. He was good catching balls out of the backfield. He had some good runs. There was a little bit of creativity sort of between the twenties for Alabama, and so I I was not ready fully for that, even though ultimately, it's a rough watch. It, well, it was a rough watch. I remember the general rhythms of the football game, but what I didn't remember is 
how much better I thought Alabama looked in that game. Yes. Just as a whole. And Trent Richardson, I'm glad you pointed him out. Not a lot of scoring in this one, but statistically speaking, and maybe athletically speaking, just from an offensive standpoint, was probably the best player on the field. He got a lot of action. As a whole, I thought Alabama just did more on offense. We're, we're going to talk about that and mm -hmm. <laughs> the implications of that statement relative to LSU, I'm sure momentarily. But I was impressed by what Alabama did. They did not win the football game. But what I thought my takeaway was now upon the rewatch is I'm glad we had a game of the century part two in which Alabama went on <laughs> to a 21 nothing victory. Not because I was a big Alabama rah-rah, but because I just I felt like they were clearly the better team in the first game. Yeah. And it didn't work out because they missed four kicks. They had ample opportunities to get a little bit more separation to grab the lead, and they weren't able to execute in some in some key spots. So at least in that sense, they were able to achieve redemption. I don't even know if they were they were I mean, to me they were better, but clearly better. They were not able to finish drives in the same fashion that LSU wasn't. They were just able to have more successful drives in terms of yardage. Um, I would also add, I thought Eric Reed is right there with Trent Richardson in terms of players of the game, performances of the game. Eric Reed was phenomenal. He was all over the place stopping the run and had that huge interception, which we'll get to. Um, I thought LSU was awful on offense. <laughs> and that to me was... Yeah was a problem because they were good enough throughout the first part of their season. Jarrett Lee was the starting quarterback going into this game because he had performed pretty well. He was he was that year's Danny Etling, yep. if you will. Yeah. Um, and so in terms of, and we can get to this, main characters in this because we, we mentioned Trent Richardson as a standout, which was expected going in. He had waited behind Mark Ingram a couple years prior. And then finally, this is his big, huge chance, 2011, that is, to shine. And... You know, Alabama has the edge on the offensive line. They probably have the edge at quarterback, even though I hesitate to compliment the chin-strapped A.J. McCarron too dramatically. Did you see his I saw It was a, beard? a nice Abe Lincoln chin-strap he had it's working. Rough. It was rough. It, I didn't know that he could grow facial hair, to be honest. Pre-Musburger um, girlfriend in the, uh, maybe now wife, girlfriend in the, uh, in the crowd, but he was actually fine, especially considering it was his first year as a starter and he's playing against I number one team in the country. I thought he looked really poised in the pocket. Yeah, he, he, never missed, had, he missed a couple of bad throws. He missed though. a couple, but he was young. Yeah. He never had the strongest arm, but in terms of pocket presence, mm -hmm. I thought he actually looked pretty good despite the fact that he had an incredible LSU front seven bearing down on him on, on every play. The, the Bama O-line held up well enough to give him time to throw the ball down the field, which is one of those things when I look back, it, it jumps out at me how much more balanced Bama was on offense, mm -hmm. how much more effective they were in the passing game, and just on a really basic level, how much more willing they were to throw the ball down the field. LSU didn't throw the ball down the field at all, maybe like no. twice that entire game. And it's sort of mind-boggling. I know it's something we talked about off-air. You look at some of the receivers that LSU had. They never fully capitalized on having Odell Beckham or having Jarvis Landry. <laughs> well, that year, Landry, I don't think he affected much. I don't think he saw the field that much in this game. But they had Reuben Randall. Reuben Randall. Ruben Another Randall NFL receiver. Had, yeah. had four years of NFL experience down the road. And because of the offense, they opted to run with Jordan Jefferson, essentially a speed option offense. They weren't yeah. able to take advantage of that wide receiving core and just throw the ball down the field and take chances. The um, the Jarrett Lee Jordan Jefferson drama that unfolded in this game. Jarrett Lee starts the game, throws a back breaking interception, can't really do much through the air, gets benched. Jordan Jefferson comes in. They don't fully trust him to go downfield at all. He's running option stuff. They opt for a change up when Jordan Jefferson isn't doing well. Bring Jarrett Lee in. And he immediately throws an interception deep into their own territory, deep in their own territory. Instantly, so it it did a nice job of appeasing people watching this game who said, "Why, you know, Lee has been the guy this year. Why are you yanking him? He's been totally solid this year." And then he comes in and throws a pick immediately. And so I, I almost want to 
not revise, but we talk about main characters in this game and be it the best players, if it's Eric Reed, if it's Trent Richardson, if it's these secondaries, which by the way, we have like we're talking Tyra Matthew, Therald Simon, Eric Reed, D. Milliner, Drake Patrick, Mark Barron, like NFL, NFL, NFL type guys. Uh, it's impossible to throw down the field pretty much on either one of these defenses, as most teams found out throughout 2011. But main characters to me by the end of this were the main characters who kind of buried their head in the sand. And that was Jim McElwain and LSU's offensive coordinator, Greg Studrala. I forget how you pronounce that name. He is thrown into the mix when Steve Cragthorpe is diagnosed with Parkinson's, I think right before or right in the beginning of fall camp. And he's the offensive line coach. And I know you're going to be shocked by this, Ty. But when an offensive line coach takes over an offensive as offensive coordinator, sometimes he's going to be like, well, let's get more offensive line <laughs> on the field. Let's go power every down. Let's get seven, eight dudes on the line of scrimmage blocking every down. And LSU's offense was a rough watch because of it. I was waiting for, because we were seeing the option stuff all the time with Jordan Jefferson, I was waiting for an option pass. I was waiting for, okay, I'm going to start running off tackle and then take that step back and somebody's going to pop wide open. It could have been. It never happened. Yeah, it could have been one of those rare moments where you've got the end around and then the surprise lefty wide receiver throwing a pass. Yeah, LSU was decidedly showing very little in terms of play action or jet sweep action, which Alabama actually did show. And when they actually did show that, it kind of worked for LSU. It was very rare. Spencer Ware and Michael Ford were both pretty good just over the course of 2011. But the offense was such a rough watch. LSU had succeeded in saying, we're going to go straight at teams with power. And it had worked up to that point. And little did they know, that we're talking about a historically dominant defense for Alabama. So if we go back very quickly Mm -hmm. and just give you a a brief overview of the events, it was all field goals in regulation. We had two field goals, one piece in the second quarter. It was three, three at half. Mm -hmm. We had a 46 yarder from Cade Foster. The only field goal he made in that game in the third quarter, which put Alabama up six, three. And then in the fourth quarter, Drew Alemont, as Vern Lundquist might say, hit a 30-yarder to tie it up early in the fourth quarter. It remained scoreless for the rest of the game. In overtime, LSU gets the ball back. Drew Alemont kicks a 25-yard field goal to win it 9-6. to Let me ask you this. I'm ready. Knowing, you want to talk more characters? Well, I do want to talk characters because okay. there's this whole thing in many a book report about Main characters going in, main characters going out. Who were the main characters coming into this game? And did you feel that they paired up with the main characters, the real characters that drove the storyline now on the backside of this as we look back in retrospect? Uh, It's Saban Miles because of their history in playing tight games. LSU wins the year before, I believe, and then they have not won since. Um, We can look that up and you can verify while I'm speaking, but... Um, it's the fact that Les Miles has won a national championship at LSU. Nick Saban had won a national championship at LSU, and it's number one and number two. And the most consistent thing we have going into this game, because the quarterbacks were not household names or anybody that we really knew a ton about from a national perspective, and that we knew both of these teams had very good defenses. And we knew Honey Badger, Tyron Matthew, a good deal. But going in, it wasn't really Honey Badger versus the Alabama offense. It was nothing like that. So it was really Saban and Miles going into this game. And that's actually where I was focused going in, just how they were going to adjust and how they were going to react and how they were going to go at each other. Um, I don't know if there were any other main characters to me beyond like saying LSU's defense is a character and Alabama's defense is a character and the fact that it's at Alabama in Tuscaloosa so that Bryant Denny is a character. That's it. Well, I mean, I think you hit the key players going into the game. One that I thought had to be a key player coming out of the game was Brad Wing. Sure. The whole special teams angle to me was bigger on the LSU side than it was on the Bama side. The Bama side, obviously between Jeremy Sharp and Cade Foster, they had a negative impact on the outcome of that football game. But between Brad Wing and a gargantuan 73 yard punt, which totally Mm -hmm. flipped the field about midway through the fourth quarter after 
a devastating interception thrown by a wide receiver, Marquise Mays, deep in oh. Al- deep in uh, LSU territory by Alabama. LSU gets a chance to take over. They go three and out. But Brad Wing just uncorks a monster punt, which goes over Marque- Marque- I can't even say it. Marquise Mays' Marquise head, Mays, yeah. who had a bum ankle, couldn't turn, couldn't pivot, couldn't get back in time. He flips the field. He had six punts in this game for a total of 226 yards. It doesn't average out the best, but those were big punts, and they needed him to come through to play that field position game in the midst of a defensive struggle. And then on the place-kicking side of things, Drew Alemont, Alemont. with three big kicks, went three for three in this football game. If he misses one of those, we're talking about potentially a different outcome here. He answered the call in every which way that he had to to give LSU the victory. So those two names in particular on the LSU side maybe didn't get as much love as some of the star power that we had elsewhere on the field. But in terms of people who actually impacted the result, look no further than the place kicker and the punter. Yeah, I would add in Benny Logan just in terms of special teams and kicking because I yeah, believe sure, he had sure. the blocked kick. He had so, the blocked kick. That's right. I forgot so about LSU that. LSU special teams. Yeah, in terms of characters who came up huge, I you have to include him. Um, yeah, you're right on all counts because LSU couldn't move the ball. You look at their drives, and I don't know if uh, <laughs> you want me to play my uh, Dvorak, <laughs> but <laughs> this was pre-Dvorak, Dvorak. <laughs> this is field goal miss, punt, field goal miss, interception, field goal miss, punt, field goal good, end of half, punt, punt, interception, field goal good, punt, interception, field goal good. Interception, punt, 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 end of game or end of regulation, field goal missed, field goal good. So that you, special teams was huge because you also look at the actual LSU offensive drives and it's eight plays, 11 yards because of penalties, uh, three plays, two yards. There, it's just 11 play, have 11 plays, 74 yards. That ends in a field goal at the half. And it, then the second half opens with six plays, 12 yards. This was not. This, I mean, this was a perfect game for for it, Dvorak and LSU Bama. It was the Dvorak game of the century in it's, many it's ways. exactly right. Do you think that the people running this broadcast for CBS knew in advance that they were going to get this kind of game? And that's why they played Hot Shell Rays Tonight Tonight <laughs> as the lead in to this broadcast? <sighs> yeah. Yeah, I think so. Like, the Um, only reason you play Hot Shell Ray in 2011 is if you're trying a little too hard to spice things up. Well, I mean, it's it's a game everybody was looking forward to for a long time. And when you look at the American songbook of the past 100, 200 (laughs) years, with all of the options laid out in front of you... Everything comes up Hot Shell Ray. How do you not go Hot Shell Ray? And... (laughs) You have to agree. There, I have a lot of thoughts about music supervisors, <laughs> yeah. but I agree with everything about what was going on in this game. Um, something else, character wise, that occurred to me at the start of the game when they're bringing up the like, and here's the starting lineups for uh, for the tide. This is post Julio Jones, pre Amari Cooper, Calvin Ridley, Jerry Judy. You know, having four or five stars at every receiver slot and every skill position slot on offense. And you look at who, skill position-wise, they're really good. It was Trent Richardson and Eddie Lacy in the backfield. And Eddie Lacy gets in a little bit. He's not the starter. But it's Kevin Norwood, DeAndrew White, Darius Hanks, Marquise Mays, Kenny Bell, Michael Williams at tight end. This isn't O.J. Howard. This isn't, you know, these are not guys who was Irv Smith this year who goes pretty high in the draft. And that was a little bit, not alarming, but... I had forgotten that there was that weird gap era where they just weren't stacked with top, top, top end talent there. And they still found a way. Still found a way. Didn't really go to them a lot, but they, uh, I, that was one of my things. And this is why I saw it said the offensive coordinators were my main characters. It's just like, I don't know what they actually trust in this game beyond running straight ahead and going for dives, dives, dives. There was a lot of nervousness when it came to play calling. I think yeah. especially so on the LSU side of things. Okay. But um, all I'm all, with I you. think I think we're on the same page. The other thing that I'll mention, then we'll move on. Talking about the Alabama lineup. Mm-hmm. Should have been a bit of foreshadowing. 
when Vern Lundquist announced at the beginning that Alabama has two kickers. Oh, yeah. A short kicker and a long kicker that yeah, they might use good. in this. Way. That is usually a bad sign. If you have FYI. two kickers, you don't have one kicker. That's right. That's what they say. Um, did you feel bad for anybody as you're writing this book report in this game? I felt bad for Cade Foster missing the kick. I felt bad for I feel bad when college kickers miss kicks. I do. I do, too. I felt bad for that. I felt bad for <laughs> a little bad for the sad Alabama fan, because this was the birth of that. It, I mean, there have been like three or four famous sad Bama fans and sad fans in general. But I want to say this was he was the godfather, whatever his name is. And they, they cut to him a couple times at the end of the game, nervous in overtime. And then when Alabama loses, when the kick goes through and he's being consoled by a, a young girl next to him. Yeah. And right. it's, uh, I felt, I felt a little bit bad for him because he was probably drunk. He was probably just having a lot of emotions. Maybe he was trying to impress the girl next to him and he couldn't keep his emotions in check. It was a rough night for him. I felt bad for Jordan Jefferson. Yeah. Jordan Jefferson was, was, was immensely talented. Wasn't the best quarterback. Okay. Right. Let's be, let's be clear. Mm-hmm. But in many ways embodied some of the frustration that the LSU fan base, we would later learn had with Les Miles. Yeah. Like they had all this talent on the field and they couldn't assemble the pieces in a more meaningful way on offense. And Jordan Jefferson, he, he kind of represented that. And in this game, at this point in time, mind you, LSU was very successful. I don't know if the angst had quite built up around Les yeah, Miles. Yeah, they were fine. Yeah. Right. But later on, a couple of years down the road, we, we saw this manifest in a different way. It really came to a head. That's why Les Miles was on the outs. Yeah. And Jordan Jefferson, again, very talented, very athletic, but it was put in a situation that it, it was really tough for him to succeed against a really high high level defense like Alabama. Yeah. That's fair. Uh, I felt bad for OBJ. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to see him. I wanted to see a tunnel screen, a jailbreak screen, a bubble screen. Like, well, I we understand had that- you're not going to test the Alabama secondary deep. You're not going to put them in a position yeah. to struggle. But they really didn't trust Ruben Randall or I think Russell Shepard was Russell playing Shepard. the slot a little bit. They, had- they did not trust these guys at all. The clear, most talented players on this offense. They had a tunnel screen called for OBJ. Mm-hmm. And they also put OBJ back for a punt return, right? which he damn near broke, but yeah. then it was called back called because back, yeah. Teron Matthew clotheslined somebody. It happens. Who among On the us? punt return. Yeah. Yeah. It was a rough watch. I-, I wanted more from a young OBJ. Not his fault. Were there any characters you admired? <sighs> yeah. Anybody playing in the secondary in this game. I mean, I mentioned Eric Reed. He comes up with a huge interception on the trick play, and he shouldn't have been where he was. He just improvised and saw Michael Williams running free and, and made the play to, to rip it out of his hands. He was everywhere, so I admired him. Morris Claiborne, I was positive, was going to be an amazing NFL player. Apparently, he just wasn't, but he was great in this game against Bama's receivers. Yeah, I, I basically admired everybody playing defense but i i admired a for him pretty svelte eddie lacy coming in and spelling trent richardson yeah yeah i like that i i was expecting a little bit more eddie lacy but ultimately no not so much and uh a young kirby smart kirby smart Just, by the way a very 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 clear shot if you go back and watch the youtube of him picking his nose Rolling up whatever he picked out of his nose and then flinging it onto the field. Let he who hath not picked thy nose cast... I don't know the rest of this. I'm not casting (laughs) aspersions. I'm just saying. Yeah. FYI. Yeah. So that's that's who I I, I liked a good amount. I'm going to throw Gary Danielson in there. (laughs) Oh, Gary Danielson was great in this game. He was like full... He was 110% Gary. First off... He is amazingly on a first name basis with everybody on the field. Mm-hmm. Everybody in college football, maybe life in general, yeah, knows their first name is comfortable referring to them by their first name only. Mm-hmm. That's the first thing. We had Trent. Yeah. Secondly, AJ. Yeah. Secondly, we know he's a bit of an SEC cheerleader. Yeah. This much is known. I mean, he went to Purdue, right? Isn't he that went to Purdue the cradle of SEC quarterbacks? Now? That's right. 
took a little extra elbow grease to shine this one up. Not going to lie. Yeah, it, it went from them pivoting from, well, they can't get it done kicking game or in the red zone to, but this is real football. <laughs> Re- exactly. <laughs> the pivot was seamless. Yeah. Found it within himself somehow early in this game mm-hmm. to gush about both offenses. Yeah. And then with about three and a half left, just out of nowhere, like, oh, it's so good to see good defense. Ironically enough, moving the goalposts would have helped Alabama significantly. <laughs> Sorry, Gary. Um, I, I, it's not that it's a newfound appreciation, but it was just nice to go back and take a dip in the Vern Lundquist jacuzzi. Oh God, he! I mean, he screwed up a cup two, three times. On, I think he called. He was so surprised that Jordan Jefferson completed a long pass. Jordan <laughs> Jefferson back goes deep, intercepted. No, no, it's an LSU catch. Um, he 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 had a couple of slip ups, but it was so nice to have that sort of genial. Oh yeah, uh, enthusiastic Vern in the booth as a an always reliable narrator. Unlimited chortles. My favorite was wow midway through second quarter. Mm-hmm. Some dude clearly gets hit in the balls. Yeah, and Vern calmly says. He is now singing soprano. <laughs> and no, yeah. Nobody reacted. Mm-mm. It was in a very hushed, revered tone. He's now singing soprano. And then they just the, moved on to a fumble or an interception or whatever. There was one point, and we talked about this before we started, where there is Jarrett, there's a bad snap or Jarrett Lee fumbles the snap. Bog hits the ground. Jarrett Lee picks it up, fires it into four different Alabama players <laughs> and gets picked off. And Vern, kind of seeing everything before it happened, seeing the calculus in front of him on the whiteboard, his call is basically, and the snap, on the ground, Lee picks it up, throws it, interception. <laughs> Just hit like he like he was on time. It was like there was a metronome in his head. It was like, oh, I know where this is going. And it was, it was magnificent. Well, we're going to give our official opinion and analysis. Were there any themes, by the way? That themes. you, if you, so an overarching universal idea that sort of made its way throughout these four quarters and overtime. You mean other than defense wins championships and SEC, SEC, <sighs> SEC? I, I would say there's a little bit of failing upwards in okay. this game. Little Lane Kiffin previewing, ominous Lane Kiffin action with LSU doing basically nothing on offense and surviving. Um, and moving on up and winning the SEC, I think pretty comfortably, right? They just murdered Georgia in the SEC championship game. Yeah. And so right. being the noticeably worse overall team in this game, but I guess defense special teams counts for a lot. So that that was a theme to me, and it was just survival. The, it was theme, a theme, the theme was survive in advance. We had to survive as viewers. <laughs> Alabama tried its best to survive bad special teams and red zone play calling and LSU did its best to survive in just right place, right time, just survive to play another down. Here we are. And you know, favorable things can happen. Before we move on to our official opinion and analysis of this here yes, book, the final thoughts. How often do you think about your socks, Dan? Every day when I'm putting them on every single damn day. We didn't used to, but now since we've discovered Bombas socks, it has clearly mm-hmm. changed the way we think about our socks forever. Bombas has been a longtime sponsor of The Verbal. We were one of the very first podcasts that they were on, did you know? And I did. since then, you and I have amassed an arsenal of Bombas socks. We wear them to work out, we wear them to the mysterious day job, wear them out in social gatherings. Mm hmm. They're the most comfortable socks in the history of feet. They're made with super soft, natural cotton. Every pair comes with arch support, a seamless toe, a cushioned footbed. It's comfy, but not too thick. They've got all sorts of colors, patterns, lengths, styles. They look great at the gym, at the office, out of town, out on the town, wherever you are. Best of all, for every purchase you make, Bombas is going to donate a pair to someone in need. Go out, buy your Bombas now. It's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com. Slash solid. 
bombas.com slash solid. You do that today, you're going to get 20% off your very first purchase. That is one more time, B-O-M-B-A-S.com slash solid. You get 20% off bombas.com slash solid. One more time, the most comfortable socks in the history of feet. True story, Ty. Because Jody and I, Jody with an I and I have a lot of friends who also have young children, some of them ask you to take your shoes off when you enter the apartment. Sure. It's pretty common you want to bring the disgusting uh, outdoors of New York City into apartments with a baby. Not a great immune system. And so, boom, my bombas are revealed and I get questions. What are those? What? I've gotten oh. the questions too. True story. Look at that. I like those colors. Those look comfortable. I like the little lip so my, my Achilles doesn't get all irritated. I've gotten lots of questions and people are getting answers and writing bombas down on their phone and ordering for themselves. I, I just can't recommend enough how good they are. All right. We've got about 10 minutes left. Let's do it. 10 minutes left here. Final Jerry Springer thoughts. Let me ask you this. <laughs> was this worthy of the game of the century superlative that was applied to it beforehand? Yes. It's an overtime game that comes down to a field goal. You get incredible talent on one side of the ball. My personal preference is complete football. I want a back and forth. I want, you know, smart red zone play calling. I want somebody busting a big play here and there, even if defensively they're still sound for the most part. And so I'm not going to say it was perfect football, but I do ask that if you're going to be game of the century, that it's not a blowout. Yes. Hard to say that this was a blowout. Hard to say that this was in any means the whole game on any one play, a team could have scored, and now we know, won the game. <laughs> Touchdown wins the game. Statistically, if you look at the box score, it was just about dead even. Yeah. I agree with you. I think in in hindsight, we look back, and, well, we'll go here next. I, it was not the most exciting game. It was not a particularly enjoyable game for me. That's my opinion. Yeah. Vacuum, it's C-. minus. Yes. Just as a football game. Exactly. Stakes and tension. But games of the century do not necessarily need to be the best games of football. Right. Game of the century is something that you apply in context, in the moment. Anyone could look back and say that game sucked. But in context, in the moment in 2011, this is a big deal. It wasn't a blowout. It was statistically dead even. It went to overtime. There was a kick that won it. There was a rematch because it was such a close game the first time around. That, mm-hmm. to me, seems worthy of that moniker, Game of the Century. So I'm okay with that. If you watched <laughs> if you watched like an eight-year-old basketball game, and they just pressed the hell out of each other full court the entire game, and it was six all going into the last 30 seconds, you're like, I don't know what's going to happen, but something's up. somebody's going to win the game right here. I loved it. The next question, though, yeah, did you enjoy this game? I I enjoyed elements, but if you want me to answer the question with a yes or no answer, my answer is no. My answer is no as well. And as we said at the top, we were on Grantland at the time. Yeah. Which for us in 2011 meant a whole new group of listeners, people who had, mm-hmm. hadn't heard the show before. We had new people coming and going every week. And I remember you and I were pretty definitive in our disdain for this football game. Not for the teams, not for the outcome, nothing like that. Yeah. But just in general, the way that the game flowed, the fact that there was so little scoring, there were a lot of people out there who felt like we just had this thing against good defense. I remember, (laughs) I could go back and find the emails, but I remember it. It's an assault on their values. I remember it very clearly that there was staunch opposition to our unanimous viewpoint here on the show Mm -hmm. that we didn't like the game. We thought it was boring. We thought it was, we thought it was an assault on offense. I didn't enjoy the game. I didn't enjoy the game on the rewatch either. It had a novelty on the rewatch that I appreciated, but I still didn't truly enjoy it. What I came away feeling was that Alabama was the better team. Maybe not as clearly as I stated earlier, but I I just, I felt like they were the better team. They didn't win the game because they couldn't make a kick. Mm -hmm. It was just not an enjoyable experience for me. It felt like it droned on and it was too long of a game. Would you have changed any one play? I would, ooh, wow. Any one play. Any play that went 50-50. You had, you know, LSU near the end of the game. That's a burp, excuse me. Um, 
I want to say it was Michael Ford, but it may have been Spencer Ware, step on the sideline on his way into the end zone that would have been at least having a, a touchdown scored in the game. I My answer is the Marquise Mays double pass. Yes. Well, that's I would an obvious have liked one, sure. for Michael Williams to have come down with it. I'm sure Alabama fans are just like, yes, same. But they still won the national championship that year, so relax. Um, it was such a good play call at the perfect place on the field. And obviously, it's tough when you have a receiver throw a potential game-winning pass. But Michael Williams was so wide open. The throw was short. It was clearly short. Gave Eric Reed time to rip off his man and, and get to the ball and make the play and come down eventually with the ball. But I loved the play call so much. Had completely forgotten about the play. And as the ball is in the air, I was so positive it was going to be a touchdown called back for something that I forgot about yeah. because it was so obviously going to be a, an easy touchdown for Alabama and had forgotten that Eric Reed made a ridiculous play. So to me, that would have been a better outcome because of how much more complete Alabama's offense looked. I would go back and undo the Jarrett Lee interception, the second interception that we saw him throw in the third quarter. The one that was, oh, that was by, rough by Mark Barron. Not only was it rough, but as you said earlier, they brought him back in to kind of give him a chance. And Jarrett Lee, the whole story of Jarrett Lee, the character arc of him, Jordan Jefferson had been involved in an altercation in yep. the offseason. He was suspended. Jarrett Lee came in and was having a great season. After being much maligned. After being much his maligned career, yeah. to that point. And so, obviously, it didn't work out early in that game. He comes in and gets another chance to try and make his mark on this game. If he doesn't throw that interception there, I'm curious to see which direction this game heads. Now, of course, LSU does go on to win the game in overtime. Yeah. But I just wonder if a more confident, more able-bodied passer, which is weird to say in Jarrett Lee, yeah. but certainly more so than Jordan Jefferson, if he's in the game... So. You not don't think? with not with no not with the game that was being called. But to I, that I didn't point, trust to that point in the season though, Lee had been a pretty good passer. Sure. So if he had more of a chance or more confidence or more whatever to showcase that down the stretch, I'm curious to see if this game would have had a little bit of a different face on it. I still the 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 thing is the in the offensive coordinating booths in the offensive booths there was nobody that said, oh, I see what they're doing. I see. Okay, here we go. Here's the counter move. There was none of that. No, none. In any sort of way of success. It was zero so, dimensional chess. So to me, yes, having Jarrett Lee not throw interceptions would have been better. LSU ultimately wins. Maybe they score a touchdown. I don't know. Maybe they bust something on a, a bad Alabama breakdown. But I don't think it makes a huge difference because I don't think they trusted him and I don't think that they were able to organize an offense to to drive them down the field because they just there was no evidence of that against Alabama twice now right now that we have that benefit okay Dan that brings us to our final question yeah like any good book report would you recommend this story to a friend yes I would I think it's important <laughs> like the the very like a parent telling you like you should read that you should watch this movie it's important to watch Bridge Over the River Kwai and Bridge Over the River Kwai is fine <laughs> but there are certain there are certain lookbacks where you're like I understand why it's important to see how the game has evolved how Alabama has gotten better you know now they're running RPOs with Tua and LSU presumably eventually uh, you know they have the I think it's 2013 with Zach Mettenberger with those receivers and Jeremy Hill and they take a huge step forward that year I get that so I'm going to say yes to to understand from where we came from which we came whatever watch it but. Go in knowing the context. I approach this game the same way I approach the Baseball Hall of Fame. <laughs> okay. Now, you know I'm not a fan of either. Okay. But I think the value in both is that you can't tell the story of the game without including it. Of course. You can't tell the story of 2011 without talking about the game of the century, right? Mm -hmm. It was a defining moment in the 2011 season, as we outlined at the top of the show, a lot happened in 2011. You can't tell the story of that season without talking and recommending that more people learn about this football game. So that's the first thing. But secondly, how often do we see it, Dan, 
where a game is supposed to be a defensive slugfest and it turns into a shootout or vice versa. Right. Very rarely or more rarely than you would think, let's say, do these games actually live up to the pregame billing? It's going to be a shootout. It's 23-17. Yeah. Like very rarely or, or again, more rarely than you'd think that ends up being the case. That was not the case here. It was a true slugfest. <laughs> it may not have been the best offensive showing, but it was true to form. It was true to form. So at least in that sense, maybe not the most exciting story, but definitely a story that needs to be rewatched, needs to be relearned because it was a significant moment in college football and certainly the arc of both these two teams. As he just said, Alabama's evolved a great deal on offense. LSU didn't evolve much on offense from this point forward, and it did lead to the demise of Les Miles. The weird thing, though, when we talk about that and the evolution, yes, the evolution of their, both of these teams have been more creative than they were this season. And it, we'll go back to analytics. Alabama finishes 20th offensive points per drive this season. So a totally good, pretty good offense overall. LSU, offensive points per drive that year, 25th. You're still talking a yeah. top-ish tier, not yeah. the top, top tier. So basically it's like, they could get away with lying to dad, but yeah. mom's home. That's right. <laughs> they couldn't that's exactly, do it against each other. That's the point that we need to underscore for sure. It yeah. wasn't these were not bad teams at all. These teams killed everyone else. Yeah. Okay, but within the context of this game, you can you can learn an awful lot. So that's why you got to recommend it to a friend. I would also add as an epilogue, uh, the number of times LSU crosses midfield in the national championship is. Zero. Zero. Point zero. <laughs> zero. 21 to nothing was the final when these two teams played in the then BCS National Championship game. How many touchdowns scored in that game? One. One. <laughs> Alabama, in a, a, a twist, a surprising shocker, makes a bunch of field goals. And I think the touchdown they do score is at the very end, a, a longer Trent Richardson run. So the epilogue for these two teams is that. And then the epilogue for the season is. If you remember, not only was that November wild from this game, from Paterno being fired, I think Ohio State loses to Penn State in the first game without Joe Paterno, right? It's a 20 to 13, 20 to 14 game. Matt McGloin, Braxton Miller, Stefan Green. Oh, man. Stefan Green, Silas Red, Penn State victory. Silas, business decision, yeah. Business decision, Silas. And then three weeks after this game, you have the weekend of just. It, of the last, what, 10 years or something like that, it might be the best college football weekend we've had in terms of upsets and wild and crazy events. So Oklahoma State loses on Thursday night to Iowa State as a top number two team in the country. Oregon loses to USC 38-35. I was there. It was not cool. <laughs> it's not cool. Um, I watched the RG3 buzzer beater against Oklahoma where he throws across the field in the Oregon press box, and that yeah. was cool. That was cool. That was definitely cool. Um, unranked NC State, and that's Mike Glennon in the original, original Junkyard Jim Washington. That's right. Comfortably beats number seven Clemson. Unranked NC State, big snub, top 10 Clemson. Um, and then I just mentioned there was the Ohio State Penn State game where I want to say Matt McGloin and Braxton Miller combined to go like 15 of 40. <laughs> it was not, it set quarterbacking in the Big Ten back a little bit. That was, I don't know, that was a Jay Paterno offense. That was it spread was, HD. Yeah. And you know what? It was actually a pretty good bowl season as well. We talk about yeah. the BCS, this relic of the past, but. Outside of the 21 to nil Alabama win, which was kind of a boring game, more of a boring game than what we saw here. We mm -hmm. had some interesting storylines. Two of the other four BCS games went to overtime Michigan over Virginia Tech in the Sugar Bowl. We had Oklahoma State win 41 38 over Stanford in the Fiesta yeah. Bowl. I remember that game. Yep. We had Oregon over Wisconsin. In the was that Russell Wilson that year? That was Russell Wilson. That was Monte Monte Ball. That yep. where he tried to hurdle somebody at Oregon and didn't work. And when a hurdle doesn't work, uh, something hurts. Some like Vern would point out, somebody singing so, soprano. Someone singing soprano. I was at that game. It was great. That was the the fumble on the sideline, but the ball doesn't go out of bounds, and Chip Kelly's like pointing at it right yeah, on top. Yeah, of it. yeah, yeah. Still that's in right. play. We had, so Oregon wins that game. It was a one score game, forty five thirty eight. And mm -hmm. then there was that epic Orange Bowl where Woo! West Virginia destroyed Clemson 70-33. to 33. Not to and pile that, on. That sort of set in motion 
this new Clemson dynasty because yeah. from that point forward, things changed in a big way for the Clemson Tigers. Sure. That's the higher of Venables. Yeah, after they get rid of Kevin Steele. Um, you got the, your classic fight hunger bowl yep. where I think <laughs> there was it was Illinois, UCLA, and either, I forget who was like five and six, but got in because of good grades. There was something <laughs> like that. Um, I'm trying to remember the other games. I'm looking at this list. Rutgers was not only in, but wins a bowl game. They win the yeah. pinstripe bowl. Michigan State scores 30 game, 30 points in a single game, if you can believe it. Um, you have Florida State, Notre Dame, and that's the Champ Sports Bowl, and that's the it's a muddy monsoony mess. But that was the start of the upswing for a young Irish team. I remember watching that game. Is that EJ they, Manuel? Uh yes, I think so. Okay. But I remember watching that game and thinking this is the start of something for Notre Dame. And it, you know, well, we won't go too into Notre Dame, but that was a good showing for them. And then you have Texas Cal in the Holiday Bowl with Mac Brown's son-in-law interfering with a live ball. <laughs> this was un- an unbelievable postseason. Do you want to feel old? I'm ready. Arkansas went 10-2 and two that season. Oh, Tyler Wilson, Arkansas. Tyler Wilson, Jarius Wright, Arkansas. They won the Cotton Bowl over number eight, K-State, 29-16. to 16. What a world. Yeah. And uh, I think Penn State loses to Houston in the Ticket City Bowl is what I'm seeing right here. That is correct. That was a tumultuous year for Penn State. It was a tumultuous year. Um, wow. Wow. What a, what, just what a year. We covered some ground here, man. I am excited by this show. I'm ready to do it again next year. All right. Well, Pit three, Oregon State zero. Or we what, could talk about the Sun yeah. Bowl if you want. Let's pick, let's do like TCU Baylor. 24, whatever the 6158 is here. Let's just go the opposite way. Okay. Write in. Let us know if there are any games we should do our next book report on. Mm-hmm. We might have opportunity to do it this year. If not, there's a long off season waiting for us after the 2019 season. Don't forget, sign up for the newsletter because we got stuff we're going to be sending out. Yup. Solidverbal.com is where you can find that form. Just give us your email address. Not going to spam you, we promise, but you'll be in line for all of our cool announcements. You've yep. also got those shirts, solidverbal.com slash store. If you want to go right to it, if you're on your phone somewhere, solidverbal.com slash store. Three new shirts. We've also got tank tops. We're working on getting some mugs and tumblers and also activating some of the favorite shirts of the past. If you mm-hmm. don't already follow us on social media, we are on Twitter. We are on Facebook. We are on Instagram. And if you're one of our loyal or lawyer for ballers <laughs> going out to reddit.com slash r slash solid verbal where all the cool kids hang out and talk about every show. Peter from the sub emailed me. They're going to have our friend Nicole Auerbach on yes, to do an AMA here yeah. on the flip side of the July 4th holiday. She's got a lot of opinions, thoughts, and things to say. Absolutely. So fun times ahead as we now enter the full on summer mode of the verbal We're excited to be with you. We'll be with you once a week until, I guess, sometime later in July when we start doing two-a-week previews. You can't see me, but I'm clapping like Les Miles right now. Palms only. Palms only. For that guy over there, my good friend Dan Rubenstein, for myself, Ty Hildenbrandt, we will catch you all in a week. In the meantime, enjoy the rest of your week, all of your weekend. And in the meantime, stay solid. Peace. Peace.